Uh, we're very pleased tonight to have this event as a co-sponsorship with the University of Florida. Uh, we've co-sponsored uh, with this uh, Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere for the last few years, many uh, speaker events, and we are very pleased to offer UF a public setting for uh, those of you who want to come out and then enjoy our <coughs> own public library. Um, we do have our own author series, so I do want to promote that a little bit. Um, the brochure will tell you that we have five more great authors coming this year. And Sunday at the Downtown Library will be UF's own National Book Award winner, Dr. Ibram Kendi. So please join us at 2.30 on Sunday for his award-winning book, Stamped from the Beginning, and he will be speaking about that. But tonight we have Dr. Jessica Pierce and um, my good friend and <laughs> from, the, from UF, Sophia Accord. We'll tell you about her. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, on behalf of the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere at UF and the Rockman Chair and Professor Bonnie Afros, it is really my pleasure to join Chris Kelp in welcoming you to tonight's lecture with Dr. Jessica Pierce. This is the fifth lecture in our year-long speaker series entitled Death Confronting the Great Divide. Now, each year the UF Humanities Center puts on a public speaker series that deals with a critical issue that affects all of us in our daily lives and explores how the cultural, historical, and ethical perspectives of the humanities disciplines can help us to navigate uh, this issue through our daily lives. This year, our speaker series is examining death, which is something that every living being shares. And in the, the current political climate, it's nice to talk about something that we really all share together. We'll bring us together, and it was more interesting than taxes. <laughs> so our speakers last fall looked at how humans are mourning and grieving in our contemporary world. We had speakers that talked to us about video game design as part of memorializing death. We learned about tattoos for memorializing our loved ones and car decals on windows and t-shirts. Uh, we learned about grief funerals and activist campaigns and other ways that we can take back some ownership over death and the grieving process in our lives. In contrast, the speakers this spring, beginning with Dr. Pierce, take us outside of ourselves and outside of our contemporary times to look at animals, the saints, saintly relics, and beliefs about the afterlife. We'll go back in history, we'll look at non-humans, and we'll talk about what we can learn from these other times and places and organisms about how we can understand death and um, the dying process more humanely. So please do grab a poster as you came in uh, and join us for the rest of the events in the spring. And please, if you'd like to be on our weekly email agenda, the Humanities Agenda, to learn more about these and other events, you can sign up um, at the table that you passed by. So before I introduce our speaker this evening, I'd like to thank the many people and organizations that have made this speaker series and tonight's event possible. We thank, in particular, the Alachua County Library District, the UF College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Tim Blanton, UF's Class of Shared Services, and the other uh, sponsors in our series, which are the Rothman Endowment at the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere, the UF Office of Research, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the School of Arts and Art History's Harn Eminent Scholar Lecture Series, the UF Smathers Libraries, the Departments of History and Latin America and the Center for Latin American Studies at UF, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, the Department of Religion, the Digital World Institute, and the Honors Program. <sighs> We've already <laughs> brought together a large number of people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure to see many of you in the room. So, tonight, we are here to consider what we can learn about death and what we can learn about caring for those who are nearing the end of their lives from our experiences with animals. And our guide to these questions is Dr. Jessica Pierce, a bioethicist and nonfiction writer based at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado, Denver. Dr. Pierce holds a Master's in Divinity from Harvard University and a PhD in Religious Ethics from the University of Virginia, 
for publications, one of which is on the table over there. You can check it out and read it. Um, her, her three books to date include Wild Justice, The Moral Lives of Animals, written with Mark Beckhoff, The Last Walk, Reflections on Our Pets at the Ends of Their Lives, and most recently, Run, Spot, Run, The Ethics of Keeping Pets. You may also have come across Dr. Pierce's work in the various academic journals she publishes in, or in the New York Times or Wall Street journals, where she's had several important op-ed essays. After she speaks, we'll have a question and answer session, so please hold on to your great, wonderful thoughts and questions for the conclusion of her talk. So, without further ado, I do hope that you will join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Pierce, who will speak this evening on Into the Open, What Animals Can Teach Us About Death. Enjoying the 70 degree weather. <laughs> I know it may seem cold to you, but being from the mountain of Colorado, just soaking it up. Um, so thank you for providing me with that. Um, and thank you for the kind of introduction and for inviting me here. Um, so, in thinking about the lecture series, Death Confronting the Great Divide, um, the Great Divide at first thought might seem like, you know, the chasm between life and whatever comes after life, you know, whatever afterlife or nothingness. Um, but in thinking about the theme in relation to my own work, what pops out at me is, is death the great divide between humans and animals? Um, it's long been assumed by poets, philosophers, and other scientists that animals, or that humans are the only animal really to grapple with mortality, um, the only species to have a strongly symbolic relationship to death, uh, the only species to build cemeteries or pyramids, hold funerals, um, and the only species to be so obsessively concerned with our own mortality and afraid of our own death. Um, but maybe it's time to revisit this assumption. Maybe death is of significance to other animals in ways we're only now beginning to understand. And indeed, a growing body of research suggests that a lot of animals have a complex understanding of and relationship to death and dying. So in this sense, death may not be such a great divide after all. On the other hand, how we approach the death of animals and how we approach the death of humans does seem like a rather great divide particularly in some of the core ethical presuppositions that ground our approaches to these two types of dying. And the most obvious um, divide is how we think about euthanasia, which is morally good for animals and morally bad for people to grossly oversimplify. So the question is, is death a great divide? And I leave this open for your consideration. And for the next 40 minutes or so, I will give you some possible and opposing answers to that question. Um, a little bit of um, backstory on me, just because, well, animal death is maybe a weird research topic for anybody to be in, but it's not a typical area of research for a bioethicist in particular. Um, so, and I do have to blame my dog, <laughs> Odysseus, for um, getting me into this field of, of study. Um, this is, I, I have three pictures of Obi to his life. This is Obi when he was a youngster. Um, after a hard day of mountain biking in Moab. This is Obi when he was about 12. So you can see he's he's still looking pretty good, but he's got, he's lumpy and starting to get gray. And then this is Obi when he was 14 and a half. And this is actually, um, uh, hard to talk about this slide. This was his last supper. Um, he was in hospice care at this point, and um, we had him eat the nice shortly after this picture was taken. So when Odie was going through this process of deteriorating and eventually um, dying, I was in the middle of writing a bioethics textbook. And so if you haven't heard the term bioethics, it's basically the more contemporary word for, for medical ethics. 
So the bread and butter of our field is ethical issues and death and dying. You know, so I'm sitting at my desk reading about physician-assisted suicide and withdrawing of life support and quality of life assessments. And in the background, Cody is dying. He's, you know, falling over and being incontinent and um, choking and, you know, all of these um, challenges we're facing Odie, and I'm, I'm reading about this, so this professional life and personal life became very intertwined. Um, and it really struck me that the issues that have bedeviled medical ethicists for several decades are the same ones that we deal with with our <coughs> animals. Um, you know, what makes a person, and I'm including Odie here and all animals, what makes a person's life worth living? Um, what are the practicalities of caring for a person who, whose physical and psychological condition is rapidly declining and who's really becomes a ghost of the person that he or she used to be? How do I know without being able to communicate in words whether another <laughs> being is suffering? And do we ever reach a point at which suffering becomes so profound and so protracted that hastening the death of another being is is the compassionate course of action. Um, and for those of you in the room who have walked the last mile with an animal or a human loved one, um, you know how excruciating these questions can be and how elusive the answers are. So, that's why I'm here. Um, so I want to talk first about the proposition that there is no great divide and that animals have a lot of death-related behaviors, and that they're actually similar in a lot of ways to our death-related behaviors. Um, death is something, of course, we all have to do alone. Only I can die from me. But death is also a profoundly social event, and it has reverberations throughout family, throughout community, um, throughout society. Um, and over the past few years, biologists and ethologists have begun to watch animals and see what happens when an animal dies. What are the reverberations throughout this animal's family and community? And, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a lot going on. And, you know, the, the data that we have available at this point is still pretty piecemeal. Um, a lot of it's anecdotal. But, when you put it all together, it starts to form a really interesting mosaic. And I'm just giving you some bits and pieces. So um, I'm going to start with, oh, first, um, in case you don't know the word thanatology, um, I'm, I'm thinking of this as, as the beginning of a new field of animal thanatology. So the study of death-related behaviors and practices in animal communities, and also, importantly, um, the study of the needs of the terminal ill and their caregivers. Um, so, starting with our closest relatives, um, and with many things primate, we can begin with the pioneering work of Jane Goodall. Uh, if you've read her book, Through a Window, you may remember her account of um, the death of Flo and the reaction of um, Flo's son, Clint. And um, I want to read just a little bit um, from Goodall because she really captures um, a beautiful story. Um, and um, one little bit of information that's important about the story is that Flint was born when um, Flo was quite old, and she didn't have the energy to wean him when he would normally have been weaned, so he was unusually attached to her. Um, so Goodall writes, Never shall I forget watching as three days after Flo's death, Flint climbed slowly into a tall tree with a stream. He walked along one of the branches, then stopped and stood motionless, staring down at an empty nest. After about two minutes, he turned away, and with the movements of an old man, climbed down, walked a few steps, then lay, wide eyes staring ahead. Flint sank into a depression, grew lethargic, and stopped eating. The last time I saw him, he was hollow-eyed, gaunt, and utterly depressed, huddled in the vegetation close to where Flo had died. He stayed there for several hours, struggled on a little further, and then curled up and died. 
Now it isn't surprising to see that Goodall was writing about grief several decades before other researchers were willing to ascribe a, such a human emotion um, to animals because she had a remarkable a degree of empathy for her research subjects who, against the wishes of her superiors, she gave names. Um, in one of the most recently cited recent studies, um, a team led by James Anderson out of Scotland, um, and the, I, it was interesting, their art, article in, I think it was current biology, it was a big biology journal, was called Panthanatology, which may not seem revolutionary to you, but it really is. Um, Anderson and his colleagues reported on the observations of um, a small group of captive chimpanzees in Scotland um, when Pansy, one of the old chimpanzees in the group, um, died. And they took video recordings and made ecological observations about this. And there is Pansy. Um, so Pansy lived to the right old age of 50. It's a good age for a chimpanzee. And she died what most of us would consider a good death. She passed peacefully with her adult daughter, Rosie, and a close friend, Blossom, by her side. During Pansy's last hours, Blossom, Rosie, and Blossom's son, Chippy, groomed her and stayed by her side. Just moments after Pansy finally died, Chippy jumped onto the platform in an aggressive display, <clears throat> leaped into the air, and brought his fists down on her torso. All three chimpanzees closely inspected Pansy's mouth and manipulated her limbs. They removed bits of straw from her body. Rosie stayed with her mother's body almost continuously on the night after she died. Following Pansy's death, all three chimpanzees slept fitfully. And for several days following Pansy's death, they avoided the platform where she had died, even though the body has since been removed. Um, and for several weeks, they were subdued and lethargic and ate less than normal. Now Anderson and his colleagues suggest that the group's response is parallel, and you've, I'm sure, already thought this in your minds. They parallel in striking ways our death-related behavior. Um, we have pre-death care. We have inspection of the body for signs of life, an after-death vigil, cleaning the body, and avoiding the place where death occurred. Um, another study, and I'm sorry I couldn't show the video. I wasn't able to to access it, but you can go and look it up. A very interesting um, capturing of a response to a death in a group of wild chimpanzees. Um, and they're, they're responding to the death of an adult, nine-year-old adult male community member. Um, and age and gender do matter, apparently. Um, what the researchers noted in this case was that there was um, significant variation in the type of response um, from curious observation um, and passive investigation, like grooming and smelling, to a more aggressive investigation, like shaking and dragging and frustrating beating, frustrated beating on the body. Um, and some of the factors that they thought appeared to um, influence behavior, the gender of the dead and the gender of the griever, and the females grieve differently um, than males, um, the age of the dead and the age of the griever, the type of death, the circumstances surrounding death, and the nature of the relationship between the deceased and the griever. Um, and this I found very interesting. The researchers noted, and this, these are their words, shared <coughs> ancestral tendencies and behavior toward the dead that may reflect our evolutionary history. Um, and these core behaviors, as they outline, include chronous compulsions, which, in case you don't know, um, the urge to injure, dismember, or eat parts of the bodies of the dead. Um, morbidity or a curiosity about and a manipulation of the dead body, for example, by grooming, and social theater. So, um, um, <coughs> displays surrounding the body, um, control over who has access to the body. Um, and then another report, um, this again, a report on reactions to an adult male group member um, published in the American Journal of Chromatology just this year, um, provides yet another look. And in this case, the scientists described the behavior of the group as, and this, these are their words, characterized by quiet attendance and close inspection, punctuated by rare displays. They also hypothesized that the 
death of an active adult group member may trigger more pronounced responses than the death of a socially insignificant group member, um, such as an infant. And this is consistent, they suggest, with anthropological accounts of early humans, early human societies in which the death of an infant, of an infant was um, socially insignificant to the group. Um, Now, although the death of infants may be insignificant to the group, these small deaths certainly matter to the mothers. Um, there's quite a bit of research on maternal grieving. Um, a research team from the Max Planck Institute, just to pick one example, videotaped and analyzed the behavior of a female chimpanzee after the death of her 16-month-old infant who had recently died. Um, so after carrying the infant's body around for more than a day, the mother finally laid the body out on the ground in a clearing and repeatedly approached the body and um, held her fingers to the infant's face and neck. Um, she remained near the body for about an hour and then um, carried the body over to some of the other members <coughs> of her community um, to watch them investigate the body. And the next day, she was no longer carrying. As a, I have two more. This picture just heartbreaks my heart. Um, this is the, the final primate example that I have, and um, this is ethology through pictures. Uh, it was, you may have seen it already, it got a lot of the media attention. It's uh, taken in the Cameroon at the Sanaga Young Chimpanzee Rescue Center. Um, it's just 16 chimpanzees watching as one of their community members, a deceased community member, has will pass. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So moving on to death-related behavior in non-primates, um, the most obvious place to begin is with elephants. Elephants are notorious for their interest in the bones of their dead. Um, Elephant researcher Cynthia Moss writes, even bare bleached elephant bones will stop a group if they haven't seen them before. Zoologist Ian, uh, zoologist and elephant expert Ian Douglas Hamilton believes that animal, uh, elephants have a general awareness of and curiosity about death. He says they will gather around the body of a dead herd member, gently touching the body with their trunks and feet, often standing vigil for days. Um, a study of tool use in African elephants found that they will sometimes put food in the mouths of the dead, will pack the wounds of the dead with mud, and will bury their dead under vegetation. And biologist Joyce Poole writes of elephants, I have observed a mother, her facial expression one I can recognize as grief, stand beside her stillborn baby for three days, and I have been moved deeply by the eerie silence of an elephant family as for an hour they follow the bones of their matriarch. So there have been numerous reports published of um, death-related behavior in marine mammals. Um, researchers, for example, studying the dolphins off the coast of Greece noticed that they reacted differently to the, group, to the death of a pod member depending on whether the animal had died suddenly or after a long illness. Um, in one case, research, researchers observed a mother lifting the corpse of her newborn cow above the water's surface over and over in it as if in an attempt to um, help him breathe. This went on for two full days. Uh, dolphins have also been reported to show social sexual behavior. Um, and that sexual behavior that in, in scientific lingo is non-conceptive, so we can use your imagination on that one, um, and aggression toward corpses. Orcas have been observed carrying dead infants, and pilot whales will stop when passing another dead whale. Um, and when researchers try to move them along, they will make every effort to, to get back to that dead body. Now, <coughs> birds, we've long caught our, our bird brain, but a lot of research into bird cognition over the last decade or two has um, upended most everything we thought we knew about birds, and we now don't know that they are um, highly intelligent and have a lot of very complex social behaviors, um, including death-related behaviors. Um, a report by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, found 
that yellow-billed magpies react to a death by descending on the carcass and hopping around and squawking. Um, ethologist Mark Beckhoff observed what he called funeral behavior among a group of black-billed magpies, and this is his description of it. One approached the corpse, gently pecked at it, just as an elephant would nose the carcass of another elephant, and stepped back. Another magpie did the same thing. Next, one of the magpies flew off, brought back some grass, and laid it on the corpse. Another magpie did the same. Then all four stood vigil for a few seconds, and one by one flew off. Um, Western scrub jays just recently have been observed in um, reacting to dead comrades by um, what biologists call uh, forming cacoph cacophonous aggregations, which basically means um, mobbing and screeching. Um, so and this is really interesting because it's a case of death-related behavior that doesn't seem to have anything to do with mourning or loss, but is a kind of public service announcement, like watch out, something bad happened here. Um, they all, uh, crows, wild American crows, and, come on, for some reason I found this picture amusing. <laughs> um, wild American crows have been also observed mobbing and avoiding an area where a death um, was observed, and they also scolded humans um, who had previously been seen near, near a dead crow, so guilt by association. Um, so I think they, these, Birds offer a good um, reminder that death-related behavior, um, a lot of it has to do with mourning, but certainly not all of it. There, there may be a huge span of behaviors, and we need to keep our, our minds really broad about the purposes and um, adaptive function of these behaviors. Um, and before moving on to <coughs> companion species, I want to give one final example. I hope it won't seem silly to you, but I really like it. I think it's very interesting. Um, it's death-related behavior in a non-domesticated species. It happens to be the giant African millipede. Um, so you may be skeptical, but so I heard, I heard this story from, I was out at the San Francisco and the Oakland Zoo um, this December giving um, some talks on caring for elderly animals. And one of the, one of the caretakers at the Oakland Zoo um, pulled me aside and she said, I have to tell you this story. Um, and she was responsible for the room of program animals, um, which are basically the animals that kids come in and can see and to some extent interact with. And giant African millipedes are fascinating to kids because they're kind of creepy and they're really big. <laughs> um, so what she, this is the story um, as she told it to me um, in her words. The first time I noticed it, I had arrived in the morning for work to find one of my four millipedes, and she loved her millipedes. <laughs> <laughs> Very dedicated to her millipedes. Um, laying at the surface of the tank, stretched out in an odd position. The other millipedes were under a piece of pork bark. I picked up the millipede and could tell that she was dying. Her legs weren't moving much, and she was limp in my hand. I placed her back in the tank. Coming back a few hours later, I found two of the other millipedes investigating her body. They did this for quite some time. I left the body in the tank for a couple of days, at which point the other millipedes had lost interest. I've observed the same behavior on the occasion of several other millipede deaths. Psychologist John Archer, in his book, The Nature of Grief, writes, grief will occur in species where there are prolonged relationships involving individual recognition based on parental care, kinship, or mutual benefit. Grief is a universal feature of human existence. It also, he writes, occurs widely in other social mammals and in birds, for example, after the loss of a parent, offspring, or mate. So grief is a reaction to social loss and takes either the form of active distress or passive depression. And as Archer notes, whatever its source, grief is a form of emotional suffering and one to which we should attend. In other words, however skeptical we may be about whether non-human animals understand the finality of death, they certainly understand and experience loss. Grief has a surprisingly broad taxonomic reach. It's not just chimpanzees, elephants, and whales, but also camels, buffalo, bear, dogs, rabbits, cats, goats, horses, donkeys, etc., etc. 
perhaps our greatest supply of information about grieving animals comes from our close companions, particularly dogs and cats, but also other domestic species such as horses and donkeys. And we have some donkey stories coming up. Um, veterinarian Michael Fox writes in his book, Dog Body, Dog Mind, there can be no doubt that animals possess some understanding of death. Sometimes the first response of an animal is acute grief and crying. Sometimes animals show no initial reaction to the death of a companion, human or animal. Later, though, they may begin to search for their loved ones, becoming more and more apprehensive and vigilant. Some dogs will show signs of depression, loss of appetite, listlessness. Some will vocalize. Others will grow quiet. Some will become clingy. Others will become withdrawn. But outward appearances, he says, can be deceiving because animals may not obviously and outwardly express grief in ways discernible to us. Um, and I had a, a little story about Maya. My, this is um, the dog, one of, I have two dogs now. Um, Maya was alive when Obi died. She was five and she was his best friend. They just, they loved each other. And she was his mother hand even though she was quite a bit younger. Um, and when we had Obi, um, Ethan I on the couch in my office, which was his favorite place to sleep. And Maya curled up. We didn't ask her to, um, although we, we invited her in. But she curled up on the couch right next to Obi and lay her head on his back. And it was really interesting to me. And I don't know if it means anything, but when, when he took his final breath after he had been given an injection. She lifted her head and cocked it to the side like she saw his soul be part. I don't know, but it was very interesting to, to see um, her sensitivity to the change in his status. Um, so um, a story about donkeys. I'm sorry, the quality of these photos is not very good. Um, a colleague of mine uh, sent these to me. She told the, this story to me at um, a meeting this October at the, the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care, which is a wonderful organization. If you don't know, probably don't know it, um, but you should know about it. Um, and um, she told me about her donkey Sassy and Sassy's pony friend Claire. Um, and. So Claire was 28, so she was of advanced age, and she had developed severe colic. So um, my <coughs> colleague Pamela had made a decision to euthanize. And Sassy, the donkey, and Claire, the pony, were fast friends. And so what Pamela told me is while she was waiting for the veterinarian to arrive at her ranch, she watched Sassy follow Claire around as she paced and rolled. Um, getting up again and repeating, and when Claire was down, Sassy would sniff her flank and touch with her, um, gently with her hoof. Um, and this burrow, who was noisy and boisterous and obnoxious, was very subdued and, and quiet and stayed within 10 feet of her friend um, during this time. Um, after the euthanasia, she covered Claire with a tarp. Um, and when she returned an hour later, I'm getting behind myself here, the girl was laying right next to her friend. Um, the transporter recommended leaving Sassy in the pen so that she could watch her friend being taken away. Um, she stood about 15 <coughs> feet away from this transport truck and didn't move until her friend was gone. Um, Pamela hung the pony's blanket on the fence rail and found that Sashi had taken it down and carried it over to their favorite snoozing place. Mm -hmm. um, she did, for three nights, she put the blanket back on the rail and the burrow took the blanket and took it to their place. Um, and for about three days, which I think is a long time for a donkey, didn't bray and be nauseous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, um, What's next is, I think I have to push play again um, here. It's, I'm, unfortunately, we don't have sound, but it's, I still want to show 
the video because um, it's very interesting just to where this is a group of donkeys greeting um, a dead companion. Um, if you could hear, and some, where are you? Somebody was going to do donkey brain sounds for us. <laughs> just imagine in the background, they're really, um, it's like a, if you've seen a Greek funeral, this keening, and it's very touching. Um, oh, come on.
critical moment in the family's experience. Um, so, have you heard of Oscar the Cat? <laughs> so, for those of you who have not heard of Oscar the Cat, he's a very famous cat. He's a death predicting cat, supposedly. So, um, Oscar lives uh, at the Steer House Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Rhode Island. And he has a habit of um, staking out the rooms of particular patients and curling up on the bed with them. And the staff at the nursing home noticed that the, the patients that he staked out would, um, with great consistency, then die shortly after. So um, he, they, they so began to trust his death predicting abilities that they actually started to call family when Oscar went and laid in somebody's bed and said, you know, you need to come down, your loved one is probably going to die soon. Um, so there was a lot of speculation about, you know, is Oscar really predicting death, and if he is, how is he doing it? Um, and one theory about how Oscar senses death is that he smells it, that he smells subtle chemical changes in a person's body that occur during the early stages <laughs> of the dying process, such as, for example, the breakdown of carbohydrates. You know, and this explanation, I think, is quite consistent with what we know about the sensitivity of dog and cat noses. They're much more sensitive to smell than we are. Um, dogs, for example, can be trained to detect um, certain cancers by identifying biochemical markers by smell, which I think is amazing. Um, they can be trained to detect diabetes by smell, um, changes in blood sugar. Um, they can give a warning when an epileptic is about to have a seizure by smell. So, you know, that may be a good explanation for how Oscar senses death if he does. I think a more interesting question is why is he interested in it? <laughs> what? And I have no answer for that, but, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and the, the lesson I think that we can draw from Oscar is that animals may have ways of perceiving and understanding death that we, with our very limited sensory capacities, have no idea of and that we can't even, um, what, what somebody might call the known, un, the unknown unknowns, we don't even know what the right questions are because we don't have the capacity to go there. So um, I think we need to be very open about um, what animals can and cannot understand about death, especially what they can understand about death. So maybe the great divide is not so great after all. Maybe humans are not the only ones who think about and care about death, um, and maybe it matters to animals in ways that we're just now starting to get a handle on. Um, what does this mean for how we interact with the animals in our lives? Um, going back to the example of Pansy again, Pansy's death was remarkable for a number of reasons. Um, one that I want to highlight in particular is that she was left very deliberately to die in the presence of her cage mates. Um, this is very unusual for a captive animal. Typically, captive animals are removed from the enclosure um, and are taken away to be, typically to be euthanized. Um, in the case of Pansy, they weren't being, they weren't thinking about animal welfare issues. They were interested in a research topic, you know, what will happen if we observe animals after a death. Um, but it could become an important consideration in animal welfare because um, why can't we leave animals in their enclosures when they die? Um, why can't we bring bodies back to the enclosure at some later point in time so that um, their fellow conspecifics can understand? If, if they do, I think we need to leave these as open questions. Um, what has happened? Um, and you know, a dead millipede can be left in the tank until the other millipedes have uh, a chance to investigate. And the nice thing about this is it's really easy to accommodate. It's really easy just to leave a dead millipede in the tank for a few days. So um, if one of our goals um, with animals, and this is one of the kind of um, touchstones of animal welfare, is to allow animals to um, exhibit the greatest natural range of natural behaviors, then 
we should be making every effort to allow them to also um, have death-related behaviors uh, in captivity. Do millipedes suffer if we deny them the opportunity to investigate the data? No. But it's so easy to accommodate. Why not um, give them the benefit of the doubt? As for pets, veterinarians who perform in-home euthanasia increasingly recommend that other animals in the home be allowed to watch the passing of one of their pack. Um, if euthanasia is performed at a veterinary office, a dead animal's body is often brought back home for a kind of wait, um, where the other animals can smell the body and perhaps understand what has happened. Those working with animals and their people are finding new ways to nurture the human-animal bond all the way to the bitter end. For example, veterinarians are more and more encouraging pet owners to stay with their animals through the euthanasia process. Um, the animal hospice and palliative care movement seeks to promote attention to the needs of dying animals and to their human loved ones and to allow the death process to evolve more um, holistically, more mindfully, um, to reduce the suffering of animals through better palliative care and to reduce the suffering of humans by giving them better support in the decision-making process and in the grieving process. And as we saw in the video of the dog with the dying man, um, human hospitals, hospices, and nursing homes are increasingly trying to make accommodations for people who have a strong bond to an animal, and I think that's wonderful, and I hope that that can continue to to grow because we can recognize right away um, the profound comfort this would offer to the person. Mm -hmm. It may also offer profound comfort to the animal as well. So it's a win. -win. So, to switch gears rather dramatically, <laughs> <laughs> our dramatic picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, I want to talk just briefly, and I'm going to quit really soon. Um, everything I've said so far suggests that death is not such a great divide. But as I noted at the beginning, when it comes to the ethics of death and dying, um, there is a rather large gulf between how we view what is right for animals and what is right for humans. And I'm just going to give you a little teaser. And this is the, the topic of the book that I'm working on right now. So um, hopefully this isn't incoherent at this, at this stage in time. Um, think again about Pansy. She was allowed to die a natural death. And this is unusual for a well cared for animal in captivity in the United States. Most of the animals under our care, um, not just companion animals in the home, but also animals in zoos and sanctuaries, die by the needle or by some other deliberate mechanism, and to use the term of art, which is not a particularly um, good vocabulary, they're euthanized. Um, and notice that I said well cared for animals. I don't know if that will seem odd to you, but um, what I have noticed is the better, the more attentive the care of the animal, the more likely that euthanasia is um, the end point for the animal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is nowhere more true than in the realm of dogs and cats, companion animals. Um, there's a fair amount of sort of moral pressure, you might say, to um, choose euthanasia as the end of life option. And in fact, you can be accused of cruelty if you fail to euthanize an animal who is obviously in pain and suffering, um, particularly if you're not attending to that pain and suffering as you should. So with animals then, euthanasia is a, is a kindness. It's a moral good. Um, we have a responsibility to provide. And the logic is, you know, there's no reason for an animal to suffer unnecessarily when we have the means and not suffering. Um, contrast this with the human situation. Oh, sorry, I forgot my euthanasia slide. Um, it's really hard to die. It's damn hard to die, in this country particularly. And um, euthanasia, the, the E word, is <laughs> often just is avoided in polite company. Um, it's considered immoral, exploitative, dangerous, 
not to mention illegal in this country at least. Um, even medical aid in dying um, makes a lot of people still quite uncomfortable and is largely out of reach for most people in this country, even though legislation is changing, it still remains um, very hard to access. Um, and what happens is that many of us wind up fearing death because it's so hard to get out. Um, we fear our own death and we fear the death of our loved ones. Um, we fear maybe not death, we fear suffering before death. And I can't tell you how many people have said to me, and I've said the same thing, after having a euthanasia experience with an animal, particularly, I mean, many of them are, are really very peaceful. Um, and people will say to me, why can't, why can't we make this available to people? It makes no sense that this isn't available to people. It's so easy in the end. Um, so the obvious explanation, of course, is just mm -hmm. that um, humans are humans and animals are not humans. <coughs> um, to put it more pointedly, human life is sacred and animal life is not. Animal life is, at least in our culture, largely considered um, disposable. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. This is just a teaser. Um, another thing that I want to explore in my book is the comparative aspect of this. And uh, I think that in human medicine, we have a lot to learn from what veterinarians are doing with animals at the end of life. There are some negative or cautionary lessons. For example, when euthanasia is morally acceptable, easily available, and very cheap, it will be over. The vulnerable, including the aged and the disabled, um, are at particular risk. Euthanasia is sometimes used as a treatment for pain when much less draconian possibilities are at hand. And financial considerations will inevitably come into the decision-making process. The major positive lesson that I think we can draw from the animal realm is that sometimes animals reach a point at which their experiential world is overwhelmingly negative. Um, when they become, as, as Ma says in The Grapes of Wrath, just pain covered in skin. And when we've tried to alleviate the suffering and nothing helps. Then, in this narrow range of cases, we have the option to hasten death. And I think this kind of blessing. And from human medicine, I think we can apply to animals the lesson that each individual life is sacred and that a strong resistance <coughs> to taking life is a sound moral foundation upon which to ground the discussion of ethics in the end of life. Anyway, Danny Lyon picture. Mm -hmm. um, so, to conclude, despite the accumulation of evidence, um, there are many who still insist that Human death is different, um, but humans are different with a capital D, and that we die with a capital D, whereas animals just die with a little d. And that we die in significant ways. You know, we have pyramids and we have Mozart's requiem in D minor. And I think the assertion of difference is what drives violence and what kills the seeds of empathy. Empathy comes from seeing ourselves in the other, and looking at dying animals and seeing a mirror reflection of our own fate may trigger, for some of us, a greater awareness uh, that each life is of immeasurable importance to the person in possession of it. So difference is not the same as uniqueness. I think we can acknowledge and celebrate the uniqueness of the human death experience without using this as a moral wedge that we drive between us and other animals. Um, because death is really the great leveler. It's not what separates us from animals, it's what ties us together. It is the inescapable price of being here, of being born. And indeed, I think it draws us closer to other living creatures than anything else. And it can serve as a point of contact and a shared experience through which we can increase our compassion for other creatures and also improve in very practical, measurable ways our care for them and also, by the way, for each other. Um, and the first slide that I showed 
Um, if you noticed it when you walked in, I didn't read it because it was long, but it was from one of my father's favorite poems, um, Rilke's Eighth Elegy, and I want to just close with a short meditation on death, also in tribute to my father from another of his favorite poems, Witness, <coughs> Some of Myself, one of the most eloquent pieces of writing about death I think I've ever seen. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>